What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Jets Radio, the fan series. And this is all about the fans talking about the New York Jets, the past, the present, the future, their life as a Jets fan, which is always a roller coaster ride. If you want to come on this, just, oh, shit, sorry about that. Just the, that's a good old blog talk, give me a good screwing. Um, if you want to come on, it's very easy to do. Just to me- direct message us on Instagram or Twitter at Talk Jets Radio. You hit me up, T R A U C H 21. And that's it. So, we're going to bring on one of my favorite callers, a great Jets fan, Hakeem Amir. What's up, man? Hey, Tyson. Thanks for having me on, man. Really excited to talk about New York Jets. Oh, dude, I'm happy to have you. And we can talk more about you, too, man. Get all about your thoughts here. So you don't have to hear me babble and ramble on stuff. This is all about you, man. Awesome, man. Yeah, I can't wait. I'm super excited. Uh, you know, I love this team, just like all the other passionate Jets fans. So I'm ready to get into it. So where did this all start for you, man? What, what made you a fan of the New York Jets? Well, I moved um, from Asia when I was like four or five years old, and we moved to New Jersey, my whole family. And, you know, I didn't know anything about football, but all my friends in school would talk about it. And I knew about the nearby teams like Giants, Jets, Eagles. And I always, like, just had this belief that, You know, you want to start with a team that is all the way at the bottom and going to, you know, rise up to the top. And Jets were just so bad and the rich coat tight. And we were having the first pick coming up. And I was a big Keyshawn Johnson fan. I always wanted to just catch touchdowns like Keyshawn Johnson. And it just fit that, like, I wanted to stay close by because I wanted to actually visit and have go to games. So that's what made me into a New York Jets fan. So, other than Keyshawn Johnson, who are some of your other favorite players? Oh, man, we got so many. Uh, but a few that really stick out to me are Jericho Cotri, uh and Brandon Moore. Like, I love the unsung heroes. Um, I think when we got rid of Jericho Cotri, it was one of the worst moves we've ever made just in terms of a locker room and chemistry standpoint. He was so clutch, and he was just so reliable. Oh, man, I, I, when I think back, I get really heartbroken over it. And then Brandon Moore, man, being an undrafted rookie and being a defensive lineman and then converting your game to a standout guard and just competing at a high level, you know, as he aged, I was just super impressed with him. But so many other great players, man. Like obviously, you got Curtis Martin, you got Darrell Revis. Those are just the great, talented players. But I, I really always enjoyed uh, the unsung heroes. So, in terms of games, are there any favorite memories you have with this team? Oh, yeah. my I guess my favorite memory will always be that wild card home game against the Colts where we blew them out 41 to nothing. That, to me, always just stands out on top. I actually went on YouTube and watched that game just like about a, two weeks ago. And, man, I just couldn't believe how good some of those players were. Like, I could see how Marvin Jones was just so good in the middle – you know, ferocious tackler. And I forgot how good Ray Mickens was, not only as just defense and tackling, but his special teams, it was just amazing. I was really impressed with that squad. Like, yeah, I don't think there could be uh, any team that could ever say they maybe held Peyton Manning to zero points in a playoff game. So, and then 41 nothing, Richie Anderson screen pass. Oh, man, I could watch that game every night. Yeah, that stadium was electric, man. I remember being there, and it was just like it was like a big party. That game was just it was a blowout, and it was awesome. And it's interesting because what would, how would you evaluate Mark Sanchez's career as a Jet? Oh man, he's a true enigma, man. He should have he should still be our quarterback if you know if he actually developed and you know if we actually took care of him. That it's a it's still tough because. You know, he got us four playoff victories uh, in a time where we don't get playoff victories. I even still make fun of my friends that are Cowboys fans when they really try to talk trash. I tell them that, hey, Mark Sanchez has more playoff wins than Tony Romo and Dak Prescott combined. You know what I mean? It's true. <laughs> but um, but I, I thought he was really clutch. You know, he, he, he was, you know, during those playoffs, he played better than he would – during like the first quarter, second quarter, and just the regular season. But overall, man, he was a turnover machine. 
He didn't have that confidence and poise to be an NFL quarterback, a starting NFL quarterback. And believe me, it's not easy. Like So, I mean, bittersweet moments with Sanchez, of course. Yeah, and then as we move forward a little bit, now we have Sam Darnold. And, you know, what are your thoughts on just where this team's progressing? You know, this is Joe Douglas' first offseason. So he had his first kind of free agency, he had his first draft. What are your thoughts on how they're doing? Well, this is, yeah, Joe's first opportunity to make drastic changes to his team. It's his first offseason. Um, I think he's done an admirable job for, you know, the cards he's been dealt and how he's been moving forward. I feel like he's taken a lot of swings at multiple positions, especially along the offensive line. Um, you know, some, sometimes you swing and sometimes we miss, like Ryan Khalil. But I, I'm glad that he took multiple swings because I think we're going to be able to piece out an offensive line and some other, and hopefully the cornerback position too. I mean, I'm a big fan of Joe Douglas. Honestly, he gives me a lot of confidence knowing that I think he can build this out the right way. I think he also proves that in the draft, um, the way he was able to you, move around the draft. So go ahead. Yeah, but do you think? Do you think the just? Well, guess we'll we'll go with the offensive line first. Do you think the offensive sure. line there's a, there's enough for this year, like to keep Sam Darnold upright, where you feel confident to get the running game going again? Yeah, I think this year we have to we have to call the right plays. I mean, I don't expect us to have a dominating offensive line presence. So we got to, you know, keep the defense off balance. We got to mix in the run and pass, stay balanced that way. I do think we've added enough, but we're not complete, right? And I think all of that is really going to fall on the development of Makai Becton. If he comes out and is able to play at a high level early on, like really stout run blocking, uh, solid pass protection, I think our offensive line performance is going to go as far as his development goes, just along the first year. I feel confident about the offensive line as, like, you know, for, like, heading down the road because I know Joe Douglas is going to constantly add to it. And um, just over the years, I know Mekhi Becton is going to develop. Um, I'm actually really high on Cameron Clark, too. But I know it's going to take time. It's like, you know, we couldn't, can't solve everything in one off season. Now, do you think – I guess this is my question. is more, I guess, about Adam Gase. But, you know, Beckton's going to be very good against the run. and It seems like they're, they're all good run blockers. Do you think Adam Gase would cater his offense to maybe feature more running, which they should with Le'Veon Bell, instead of being pass happy? Absolutely. I think that's possibly the biggest adjustment Gase has to make is we have to become very efficient at running the ball. There's no question about it. We, Sam is not ready to be in a pass-first offense, not specifically with these weapons, not with this new, newly patched offensive line. The, the, uh, you know, a dynamic passing attack takes a lot of time to build with uh, talented weapons. I, I don't, I'm not saying the Jets can't get there, but right now I definitely agree that we are uh, geared more towards the run than the pass. I hope to see double tight end sets. I hope to see, um, you know, some unique pass plays where Frank Gore could be in the backfield and then Le'Veon Bell could split into the slot. Um, I think our run game has been improved, and it's going to be on Gase to make it happen because our run game really let us down last year. And I think with the moves we made, we'll, we'll definitely improve. But, like, what is that really saying? We were at the bottom of the barrel last year, right? So we need to see significant improvement. And I, I still think the Jets may be in play for another running back, too. Well, yeah, there was rumors about Devontae Freeman, so that wouldn't surprise me at all. But I, and I could not agree with you more, man, because, like, if you can establish a running game, you have play-action pass, the defense is on their toes, and then they can't sit back and just tee off on Sam Darnold, which is what they're doing last year. So, But my question for you then is, if you can get the running game going, or if you can't, what is your level of confidence in Perryman, Mims, and Crowder, and what are your thoughts on Robbie Anderson going? Well, just as individuals, um, you know, I like Perryman as a talent, as a wide receiver in his own right. I thought he had some nice games definitely down the stretch. But, of course, you know, he's a, he's still a big question mark overall. So you like his talent, you like his ability, but you don't know what's going to happen. So a one-year flyer, I think that's fine. Um, Crowder, I'm a big fan of Crowder. I think he's a nice safety blanket for Darnold. But Crowder can't be the main guy, which was what we were forced to do last year. 
So we got to, you know, get that sorted out. I'm a big fan of Mims. I never thought he'd be there in the second round for us at 48, let alone 59. So I was really pumped to get him. Um, as far as Robbie Anderson, yeah, I was a big Robbie Anderson fan. Um, I just love that he was an undrafted free agent, you know, sort of, sort of like that unsung hero type, developed nicely. You could see the chemistry he had with Sam. You could see that he definitely had talent. And, um, you know, he was, he was fearless in some ways of trying to, you know, attack downfield. But um, it definitely hurt when he left because I was hoping that we could just seal him for at least a one- to two-year deal just so he could play the market again, just to give us some more time with Sam. So I was, I was hurt, man. I was so hurt that I had to stop, like, following him on Twitter because just every time I saw a tweet, like, it just <laughs> brought me down because in the ideal world for me, I would have loved – Perryman, Mims, Crowder, and Robbie all in one group like that, that would have felt really good. But I think the way we're looking at Robbie leaving, uh, I think we should look at it this way. So it can't just be, oh, we got Perryman instead of Robbie. Really, if we look at the money, I think we got Perryman and a Jordan Jenkins instead of Robbie. I mean, of course, still, or like a Perryman and a Brian Poole once you add up all the guaranteed money. Um, so, you know, it, it was a tough decision for sure. I, I, I will always leave my door open for Robbie to come back. I mean, he only has a two-year deal in Carolina. But, I mean, uh, it definitely hurt to see him go. But I'm, I'm more excited that we got Mims. Like, drafting Mims definitely makes me feel better. But we still have more work to do. I'm, I want to see how our debt, uh, you know, beyond our top three guys plays out. I'm hoping for a big development out of, you know, Vincent Smith or Braxton Berrios. Um, I'm not really expecting anything out of Josh Doxson or uh, even Lawrence Cager or George Campbell. Um, but I, I really want to see Vincent Smith take an, another step. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm kind of concerned about their depth and overall talent at the position. Like I'm, you know, like if, if say if, if God forbid Crowder went down or even Perryman goes down, it's like, all right, what do we have for Sam around him? Like, so I guess the answer would obviously be, listen, you could feature Chris Herndon if he could stay healthy and, and Ryan Griffin, but, I just wish they had more at the wide receiver position. Like that's like in the draft where they, where they picked the quarterback at, I kind of didn't really agree with that. You know, it's just like, you, you like the reason why I asked you the Sanchez question is I'm kind of leaning to where Sam is now. It's like, all right, well, Sanchez had, Sanchez had that offensive line, which was just his first couple of years was just mauling everybody. Then he had very, yeah. he had quality receivers around him. And then when his play deteriorated is when everything around him deteriorated. And now with Sam coming into the league, he's never really been afforded any of that. He's never had a good line. He hasn't had a stable yeah. receivers. It's like, it's been, it's just so strange. And I'm kind of worried about this year a little bit where it's like, hopefully they can gel together quickly because if not, you don't want to start out 0 and 2, 0 and 3 while this offense gets their, their feet wet. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and that's where it's going to fall on Gase. And I know we, we talked a lot about, Hey, this, you know, they didn't do a good job last year as a coaching staff um, up and down, you know, except for the defense and special teams. Um, but, like, offensively, it was really bad. And, you know, we were all saying, I was listening to the show, that, you know, people wanted an offensive change, just at least, at the, you know, on the offensive side of the ball for the coaching. Um, but I'm kind of glad that they didn't make the change because I don't want there to be any scapegoats if this thing falls yep. apart. Like, I want this just to be on Gates. He's doubled down on his staff, but the defense yep. did their part. Special teams did their part. Now, Gates, you have one, you have one more year. You've got to prove this. And if it, if it starts off like it did last year, where we go, we start, you know, one and six. Well, I'm really excited that we actually have a coach, a head coach in place that can take the job and keep the reins moving. I'm really critical of Gates in just that. He could, I think he could definitely be doing such a better job, man. I think that he he didn't, you know, set up Sam for the success that I think he's capable of. Um, I think he let our run game down by just, you know, just thinking that we, we could move, you know, horizontally and just thinking we were, you know, going to win with Kalechi Osmali and Ryan Khalil at the start. It, it was just a real disappointing Actually, but uh, but since he you know turned it around for the last second half of the season, I mean he just did a better job. Um, you know, typically I don't believe in firing coaches after one year, so he has this off season to work with. I think Joe Douglas added some pieces for him. Overall, um, I think the team is in better shape. 
And the person I'm worried about least is Sam Darnold. I truly believe we have our guy in Sam. And I think he's so talented, and I think he's only getting better. He's just scratching the surface. And we just need to build around him. If we do that, then Sam will take care of his part. Dude, I could not agree with you more. And, I I mean, I was real critical that he didn't fire his offensive line coach. I'm like, how do you have the worst offensive line of football and you don't fire the guy? But then I'm like, you know what? You're right. Where now it's like we're entering into a season where, in theory, he drafted the guys he wanted. In free agency, he got the guys he wanted. Now it's a second year of his offense. The offensive line should be better. There should be enough playmakers around to at least have a, you know, a, a capable offense. No excuses. Like, I, I really don't want to hear excuses about anything. Like, the, you came here to, you know, take offense to the next level, then show us something. Like, I, I want to see articles. And I think they're starting to come out now where it's saying, listen, the spotlight's on Adam Gase not to prove he's the right head coach for the Jets. Like, you, you, had, your, you had your wash your last year. Everything could go wrong, did go wrong, and everything else. So now, it's like, now show us what you can do and maximize Sam's potential. That's what he's hired for. I mean, obviously to win games, but you want to see this quarterback become a star. That's happening. And the play calling to me, like you said, is exactly it. Like there's so many excuses last year. Well, Sam didn't tell me what he likes and everything else. Well, now you know. Roll him out, do this. You could self-scout. I mean, the sky should be the limit now. Like the playbook should be open now. Absolutely. I mean, I'm ready to see our offense definitely take a step. Um, we have to show not just baby steps of improvement. I need to see significant improvement along the running game and, uh, and the play action passing. I, I need them to complement each other. Um, I hated yep. seeing us do a play action pass when we were just going nowhere on the, on the ground. Yep. It, it was, it was like almost laughable and, and that's not giving Sam a chance to succeed, but I think, you know, we're building the team this right, the right way because, you know, Joe Douglas is, you know, he, he, I think he's improved a lot of positions overall, whether that's adding the top starter talent or even adding to the depth. I think we have some very deep positions, like, you know, inside linebacker, defensive tackle, uh, even safety. Um, but, you know, we got more work to do. I'm, I'm excited because I think um, Joe is really good at, um, you know, building depth. And hopefully we're going to see some uh, starters or stars emerge from those positions moving forward. Well, I think that's the biggest thing. If you look at the offensive line, that's my biggest takeaway is we have a lot better depth. So if one of these guys doesn't pan out, like if you say, even if Brian Winters does start, you have a very good backup behind them. You know, like if Alex Lewis, you can move him around. There's a lot of versatility. They're good athletes. And there's just better overall depth. And if you look at the corner position, I guess which we can go to next, same thing. Like they got rid of the bloated salary in, in Tremaine Johnson, Dow Roberts, whatever. And now you have a lot of a lot of young guys competing for playing time. You got Pierre Desir. It's like a nice overall, and they're like most of them are one year contracts, so they're going to be through playing for money, which is always a good thing. So there'd be an edge there. What are your thoughts about this revamp secondary? Yeah, I'm I'm liking the competition they're bringing in. Man, uh, getting rid of Tremaine Johnson um, was was just like an addition by subtraction, you know, like it was just so obvious that he was just content with whatever was going on. Um, He was getting paid huge money. I mean, huge, like superstar money. And he, you know, he bamboozled me too, because I was so happy when they got him. I thought we had a legit number one corner. I knew he was going to give up some plays, but I was hoping for big plays on his end. And it just never materialized. And it was really sad because, you know, he was supposed to help Todd Bowles' defense, you know, stay together and just keep it intact. But it was just a horrible move that we're still paying for. I can't wait till June 1st when we freaking get that money just to have yep. some more wiggle room. Uh, but you know what? I should have known Truman Johnson was freaking doomed from the start because right after he got signed, like two weeks later, he went on Twitter and he posted a, Hey, ask me anything. You know, I tweet back. Well, I remember a bunch of comments coming in. This guy never replied to anything. I even went back like a few months. Guys, I'm still waiting for my uh, comment back. Uh, so I should have known that, man. <laughs> but overall, I, I, I like that we added a lot of talent to the cornerback position. Pierre this year, if he can stay healthy, he's going to hopefully solidify that cornerback spot, at least one of the starting spots. Quincy Wilson. I, I don't think he's going to end up making the roster, but it's a it's a flyer that I'm worth, you know, we can try it. I would have rather have used that draft pick and then 
maybe waited for Wilson to hit the free agent market during training camp or something. But uh, Bryce Hall, really high on him. He's a super competitive kid. And he'll, he's going to even be willing to play special teams. And I love corners that are also willing to play special teams by Arthur Marlette. Uh, I feel like we have some very good tackling corners, um, especially led by, you know, Brian Poole. So as long as we don't give up the big play, I think our defense could be ready to solidify their top 10 status. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And, and the only, I guess, the only issue, which I kind of keep bringing up, is that I wish we had more of a pass rush. Um, you know, obviously, C.J. Mosley coming back changes a lot of things. Quinn Williams should, should be have a much better year this year in theory. You probably get a better year out of Henry Anderson. He didn't do much last year. But then it's like, do you look and go, you know, Jordan Jacobs coming back, who I'm a big fan of, but do you still look and go out to the free agent market and try to find another guy like Golden or Griffin? Or I'm not a fan of Clowney, but would you go out to one of those guys too? We should be looking at that market. Um, I believe we have a lot of number two edge rushers. We don't have yep. a number one, right? Um, we even got a couple of number three types, but, you know, we've been waiting for Jordan Jenkins to make that jump. Uh, he's in another contract prove it year, so he could. I'm actually high on Terrell Basham. I think he showed a lot of uh, some yep. good snaps um, over time. But, uh, again, I would be happier if they were my number two pass rusher. Um, I think in the free agent market, um, I, I wouldn't pay Clowney um, just because of the injury risk, although he's a great run defender. Um, but that's not something we need. You know, uh, we're, I think we were already very stout against the run. Um, Golden is someone I like because I think he's got a nice burst off the edge. Um, yep. I just think, you know, edge position is the hardest to find. So the only way we're going to even be able to find someone like that is either draft one or trade for one. Um, and I, I'll tell you, I think I'm higher on Jabari Zuniga than most people. Um, I think that his junior year was a very good year. Um, going back for his senior year, if he would have stayed healthy, he would have definitely been a second to first round pick. Um, and, you know, with this year being really weird with the pandemic, we were only able to see combine and no pro days. So, I mean, I'm not super big on just combine results, but I think Jabari Zuniga had an outstanding combine, man. He had 264 pounds. He ran a 4.6440. And he put up 29 reps on the bench press. Like, and then matching it with his production on the film, in the film room, um, I, I see a lot of potential in Jabari Zuniga. I just think it's going to take a little time. Yeah, and that's the one thing that Joe Douglas kind of capitalized on was all the injuries where you got Bryce Hall, you got Zuniga, you got Ashton Davis, where it's like, you know, he seems like he got really good rally, really good value in the spots he got them based on probably the, team, the team's not being able to work out some of these guys. I mean, wouldn't you think that's kind of how he maybe stuck these guys in? Absolutely. He uses every advantage in, in that's available to him. And you can just tell he's a seasoned guy in Joe Douglas. Like, he yep. knows every avenue to explore. He does his due diligence. He's going to call every person. You know, he's going he's gonna to have open lines of communication from everyone, and, and I appreciate that. That's why I feel really good about him. But then, and then, you know, along with being seasoned, I just think he's a talented evaluator. And so, you know, I think this draft worked out really nicely for him because he was able, with all of his draft picks, we, all, we saw – some common themes. And I think some of those were, you know, they were explosive players that they drafted. Um, they were productive and they had high character. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, so I, and that's something that we never really had. We, I mean, I know you, we are, I, we can feel the plan that he has in place. Uh, sometimes, you know, we wish he'd be more aggressive, you know, uh, for a specific player, but I think, with Joe, we should just got to stay patient because he's always scouring every, you know, corner to just get – to keep making this team better. And, um, man, this, this draft has me feeling really good about it. Yeah, and the thing is, like, under Mike McCagden, we really never knew what a Mike McCagden kind of player was, but you had no idea. Where in one draft under Joe Douglas, one free agency period, we already know. It's like he wants you to be versatile – you know, hardworking, like team captain kind of guy, almost like the Eric Mangini kind of mindset, mindset where it's like you want football guys 
high character guys, locker room guys, like the no nonsense stuff where they love the game of football. They're going to give you everything they have. It's team first. And that goes a long way to changing your culture and getting just a whole new mindset in a locker room when you can overcome this losing history we have here. But Joe Douglas is going to be tested, man. And I think his biggest test right now is going to be Jamal Adams and his contract. How do you think this plays out? Yeah, absolutely right. I think that was a great way to put it, that this is Joe Douglas's biggest test. Um, you know, so far it hasn't been good as a Jets fan, you know, listening to Jamal Adams and the Jets in the media just about, you know, this contract dispute. Um, I, I'm not as down about it as a lot of our, the Jets fans I see on Twitter. Um, first things I guess I got to make clear is that I want to keep Jamal. If it was my choice, of course, I'd pay him, you know, whatever to keep him signed up. Um, but, you know, it's not my call, right? So this is Joe Douglas's first stare down with a superstar um, player that's going to command huge money and huge guarantees. He's got to set the precedent on how he's going to move about these negotiations because Sam's going to be around the corner after that. And then there's going to be another player, you know, if the drafts go well, it's just just going to be a routine thing. This is a good problem to have where we have a superstar player wanting to be paid top dollar, you know, Um, this is actually a good problem to have. But I think that Joe is going to wait till 2021. So Jamal's not going to get his extension this year. And that's also due to the pandemic um, because you don't know what's going to happen with NFL revenue. Um, but also I think it has a little thing, a little bit to do with ownership because I don't think the Johnson family is willing to put out $40,000 or 40, excuse me, $40 million into a, a trust as Jamal's guarantee money during a pandemic. And during a time where Johnson and Johnson is also having their own, you know, litigation stuff on the side. So I, I just don't think it's the right time. So I think, it's going to be a little messy throughout the off season. There's going to be jabs made from Jamal's camp, but I think we got to realize this is just going to be the routine of contract negotiations among superstar players these days, because this is all they have is Twitter, uh, social media, and the fans. Um, with the new CBA in place, it's really difficult for them to withhold their services. Uh, and I mean, it's sad because I love Jamal and any person wanting to trade Jamal is out of their mind. Um, Jamal is not just a safety. He makes others around him better. He is already a star, but there was a time during last season where he was playing like a defensive player of the year, and he's only getting better. I mean, he's got so many great years ahead of him. Um, So we need to keep him. He's a captain. He's a leader of our team. Um, I like him a lot. I don't agree with, you know, his movement, but that's his right because uh, he's, you know, as, that's all he has. He's, I mean, no one else knows what he's going through because we're just fans. So I think in one year he'll have a great big extension and everyone will be happy. Yeah, I, I think it's a great test for Joe Douglas. You know, it's like – Jamal has done everything right on the field. You know, he's gotten better every year. He's an all-pro player. He's super young. The sky's the limit. You put C.J. Mosley in front of him, he's going to play even better. And I pay him, too. Like, I, I, I'm like, listen, I hate the idea of trading him. Like, we've waited so long for a player like this. To get rid of him is just, to me, it's just mind-numbing. I couldn't even think about it. Like, find a way to keep him. Find a way to make him happy. Give him the contract. I don't care about the money. And I, I, I agree with you about the ownership. That's going to be interesting to see. You know, what kind of stance they take if they're saying, listen, we'll pay you next year, we promise you, or they find a way to pay him this year. But I think it's – the answer is keep them. I, don't, I, I agree with you. I think trading was just a terrible idea. Um, looking at this team now, what are your – what are realistic expectations of the Jets fan? Like a lot of people are like, oh, it's like, you know, anywhere between 6 and 10 and 10 and 6. I'm like, you, we can be a little more specific than that. Like what do, you, what do you honestly believe this team could do this year? You know, if we can stay healthy – we should be winning eight, nine games. If, if, if we stay healthy at the key positions, I don't want any, you know, mono or anything like that coming up. I think we can win eight, nine games. I know the schedule is going to be tougher, but we've also gotten better. And some of those teams on our schedule have gotten a little worse. 
we, we got to surprise some folks. I mean, I don't think we're the same old Jets, man. I think we're going to, we're going to surprise them with some games that we shouldn't win. We're going to win some of those, but we got to stop losing the games where we should easily win. And no, yep. you know, we all know which ones I'm talking about. I'm not even going to bring it up because we're already, you know, we already got bigger problems than that, but um, it's, it's, it's important. And you know what? It all starts with CJ Mosley. And I'm going to call our big, our good friend CJ Mosley out right now, because when I think about the season, right. You know, okay. First game coming out, looking outstanding. We're looking like a, a top two defense with him. This is the first three quarters. Then gets hurt. Okay. You know, take all the time you need. It's, it's a soft tissue injury. You know, we, we, we'll give you all the time. Um, I think we're, I don't know, Jets have just beat Dallas, right? You know, we're, we're like one in four. And then the Patriots are coming Monday night, and we're all thinking it's a big game. Like, we're one in four. And, <laughs> and I remember the, the, the week before, it's the first day of practice, or the first day reporters can talk to players. They tell, hey, CJ, how you feeling? Um, you think you're going to be able to play this week? Oh, I'm definitely playing. Well, are you sure, CJ? I mean, you, know, you don't want to play it day by day? No, I'm definitely playing. Okay, I don't know why you put that pressure on yourself because we, you know, he said that maybe on a Tuesday and we were playing Monday night. Now we're game planning with CJ at the mic. And you come out and we just get blown, you know, we just get blown out in all facets. It was a terrible performance all the way around. But then you're back, you're injured again. And now you're just holding up a roster spot for the whole season, yep. along with yep. costing $17, $18 million. Look, I, I'm, I'm not going to hold the initial injury on you, but the, when you committed to playing that game because you thought it was the Patriots and it was a big game, we're, we were one in four, and then we lost you, you for the whole season, and we're already down Avery Williamson. I thought yep. – I thought, I, I didn't. I didn't like that at all. And I'm a huge C.J. Mosley fan. I think we have one of the best in, inside linebackers in him, and in, inside linebacking like depth overall in the league. Like, but man, you 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 gotta stay healthy, bro. You, I think C.J. Mosley is the key to our team being either nine wings or six wings. Yep, dude, I, I completely agree. And the weird thing about when he came back, like. When he came out of the locker room to go on the field, you knew he wasn't healthy. Like, I'm like, he's limping. Like, you saw him limping. I'm like, why is he returning? And, like, well, he's playing through it. He's not going to make the injury any worse. And I'm like, nonsense. You know who he is. Like, and it's like, dude, like, we're just casual fans. Like, I'm not, a, I'm not a trainer. I'm not a coach. But, like, certain things you could just tell are just not right. And then you lose him for the year. And now it's like, all right, you know, he, he is so vital. You can do so much with him. But I, I agree with you about inside linebacker. I mean, they're loaded, dude. You got Hewitt. You got Burgess. But the guy, the other guy from Baltimore, Pina, I mean, they're loaded. Williams coming back if they keep him. I mean, they're loaded. It's just, I think they have a lot of potential um, on defense. On offense, it, it's just, I wish I was more of a believer in Adam Gase. I'm just not. And I think if anything, if the Jets succeed in 2020, it's all on Sam Darnold. He just lights it up and overcomes Adam Gase in the play calling. And he makes everybody around him better. That's how they win like nine games, in my opinion. I, I just... And I wish I thought differently, but I just haven't seen anything to make me think otherwise. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like you, we saw like his like last year in the, even the game plans after the first 15 scripted plays, they went into like a lull for like a quarter and a half until they made some kind of adjustment into like the middle of the third quarter. And you just want to see more consistency out of play calling. You, uh, you hope that Aaron, you know, Adam Gase isn't arrogant and he can actually use Le'Veon Bell the way he's supposed to be used, especially behind this offensive line, get Chris Herndon, like, maximize everybody's potential. If they can do that, Sam will flourish, and they can do so many things. If they're stagnant on offense and the defense is on the field 35, 40 minutes a game, I mean, dude, we could be in the same boat we were in last year again. Absolutely. I mean, I really think Gase is, would be the only person getting in Sam's way of taking this team to where we want to go. He's got to be a real support system for him. Um, he's got to you just got to call some money plays to just get Sam going. And, and, and stop. And and he's got to stop calling him out, dude. You know, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but the one thing that pisses me off about yeah. Adam Gase is, like, the one thing I give Rex Ryan credit for was he always had his players back. And this point's been made on a lot of these interviews that we've been doing. 
it's like, you know, you knew he had Sanchez's back, and he had, he had the back of his players. Sometimes Adam Gase just lets Sam Donald, he let, leaves him out to dry. And it's like, well, you know, I called the right play, or, oh, this, you know, like, like dude, your, your play call sucked. Because if I could have 10 beers sitting in the stands and still call the play and know exactly where it's going to, who it's going to, there's a problem. Like if, we, if we can predict your plays as fans, you know the opposing the defensive coordinator can. And it's just like he leaves him out to dry. Like he doesn't really like – he just – it's so weird how he handles his quarterback. Yeah, it is infuriating when you see your head coach not backing your players. Um, you know, as a head coach, you just – you got to take everything on yourself, whether it's a player's mistake or not. You discuss that in the locker room. Um, I I do agree that, you know, Rex Ryan was more of a people person. You know, he was able to connect with those individuals and just make them feel good about what they were doing. And Adam Gates really lacks that. I think there's an ego side to that because Adam just thinks he is the guy. I wish he would just be a little bit more humble. And I think – I'm hoping that we can see more of that. I need to see some maturity out of Adam Gase in just being a leader. Um, and then I think just with Sam growing, I just think, you know, if we can get them on the same page, if we can just really get our run game going, man, keep Le'Veon Bell hungry. And, I, and that's why I love the addition of Frank Gore, because I think Frank Gore will have Le'Veon Bell's respect and keep him focused on the task at hand. Um, but, yeah, man, I mean – it's all it's really on Adam Gase, but I'm glad it's on Adam Gase because we no more excuses. We need to figure this out. Are you the right man for the job or not? Because yep. if not, we, we you know, we, we gotta find someone who is. No, dude, I it's I completely agree. We need long term answers here, man. We need like stability, consistency, continuity. We need everything like everything you see in a winning organization, we need that now under Joe Douglas for Sam Darnold so this team could finally blossom and just flourish. So but my favorite question, Hakeem, is this. How, if somebody asks you, what is it like being a Jets fan? What's the life of a Jets fan? How would you describe it? I would have to say it's tough. you you <laughs> got to be tough if you're a Jets fan. And I think we all are. And that's what makes us so uh, such angry people on Twitter sometimes <laughs> because we're, we're, we're all tough. We've all been there getting, you know, mocked and laughed at. I mean, we went through the butt fumble. We went through Fitzpatrick's six interceptions in Kansas City. We, oh man, we, we we've just been a laughing stock in mono in some years. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, the mo- oh my gosh, man! It's like it's you know, it's almost some some fans would say we're cursed, right? Um, but I think that once, and I know it's coming. I don't know when, but. When we get to feel that glory, that juice will be the sweetest juice we've ever tasted. And uh, that's the only day I'm waiting for, man. And I uh, I think, and I'm praying and I'm hoping that Joe Douglas is the guy that's going to lead us there. Dude, dude, me too. I I keep saying, like, they always ask me, and I say the same thing. Like, listen, man, it's been grueling. And last season at many points broke me because I can't take anymore. Like, I'm so tired of losing and being embarrassed and, ghosts and mono and just all this nonsense. I'm so oh. tired of it. But I'm like, you know what? The Jet fans, we may be bipolar times and we're downright crazy, but when the day comes, we make the Super Bowl and actually win it. The party will be epic, dude. That's like a two-week binger, man, where this Jet fans will just, you, you just be relentless. And then the funny thing is, like, when they do win it, the following season, dude, I won't even care. They could lose all 16 games. I won't even care. I'll just be so happy. We we paid so many dues at this point. I I just be you're like right. Wouldn't you be high on life for like at least a year in football like in football years? Jeez, man, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I already know all my <laughs> other friends that are Giants or Eagles, and they don't they're not going to want anything to do with me because I'm going to be in everyone's face telling them I told you so, and <laughs> I just can't wait for that day, man. I, we definitely deserve it. I mean, I think we got the best fans out here, and that's really because of, like, people like you, man. You guys give us a voice to speak. Uh, you, Joe, Kevin, you guys do this, you know, every week during the season. Um, you know, you guys are leading the way and showing us how to be passionate Jet fans. Oh, dude, I hope, I'm not leading the way, man. I'm too crazy. I'm <laughs> but I appreciate that. But it, it's just the really cool thing about Jets fans, is, and you make a really good point, is we endure a lot, dude. It's like – 
you're like we're, we're kind of like a sec, the, like the second brother in New York to the Giants. Like we don't we haven't won in forever, and it's like we we're, we're, the, the stadium is just not the, the ultimate experience, especially now when it's half the opposing fans. Like you beat the Cowboys, you beat the Steelers, you beat the Raiders, and half the stadium is the opposing fans. It's like it's just the weirdest experience. Like you you win the game, but you can't even enjoy it sometimes, which is just absurd. So we we paid our dues, man, no doubt. And it's just like you just can't wait. Like you just you just we all say the same thing. It's like just give us that one moment. And after that, it's like everything is just golden. Like I'd be happy. I wouldn't complain anymore. I'd be like, that's it. Like football is fine then for forever because it's just it's been too long. Absolutely, man. And they need to do it not for like even guys like me. They need to do it for guys like Fireman Ed and yeah. all the you know old older guys that have been around. And I respect Fireman Ed so much, and I, I love it when he's on your show because. You can just tell he's so passionate, man. And th- those were the days when he was leading that chant. Um, and I- I'm just glad that, he, you know, he's still um, being an open Jet fan after all the, you know, crap he's been through with fans being, you know, you know, just unnecessarily evil towards him. Yeah. You know? so I-, I think yeah, I love him. Ed. I'll always have his back. No, dude, Ed's a good dude. His last interview with us was wild, but he, he's, he's as real as it comes, man. I've known him a long time, and I'm glad he's back, too. He had the stadium, even last year when the stadium was half full, he had it rocking, and that's the way it should be, man. Like, I miss the days of, of the Meadowlands where, you know, the fans were in there early, they were loud, they were proud, the, the place was rocking, and MetLife lost a lot of that, Probably, which, which, you know, pricing out the fans does that, and also losing doesn't help anything either. So, but I hope, hopefully, dude, it's like, Slowly but surely, it's all coming back. We start winning football games. Joe Douglas has us going the right direction. Now it's up to Adam Gase to do his thing and Sam to do his thing. And maybe, you know, we, we have a nice run this year or it's a really good building block for next year. Yeah, we need to start seeing some progress, basically. We can't be taking any steps back this season. Um, if we do, people are losing their jobs one way or another. Yep. Um, this is a critical time for the Jets. We need to show improvement. Um, in in a lot of areas, specifically offensively, I'm still concerned about kicker a little bit because I don't really like <laughs> me <kicking>. too. <laughs> and, and Maher, although he's got it's a lot terrible. of talent, yeah, I mean Boyer, is, Boyer suck, must be like a, the kicker whisperer or something. But I think that there's so many there's so many kickers that in training camp, like the Cowboys have two: they have Greg the Leg and um, Kai Forbath. Um, we, you know, both solid here, so they'll have to cut one. Like, I think we're just going to play out that market, but I'd, I'd rather have my kicker in place. You know what I mean? Oh, dude, I, I've been saying that. Everybody's like, dude, you're complaining about kickers now. I'm like, dude, we could we could be in a lot of close games, and the last thing I'm going to do is start shanking kicks all over the place, and they both suck. Ficken <laughs> sucks. The Maher's even they're dude, they're bad. We're, we're trying to be nice because we'll Brant Boyer and have faith in them and everything else, but. I definitely think we need somebody else. I mean, that's just <laughs> – but, but Akeem, first of all, I want to thank you so much for your time, man. I had an abs- – I was looking forward to this all day. I had an absolute blast talking Jets with you, man. You're a great fan, and you got phenomenal insight, man. I really enjoyed this. Uh, thank you so much. No, I always enjoy um, all of your shows, even the Friday ones. I, I, I love the double takes during the season. Um, yeah, Joe – um, got a lot of respect for that guy, Kevin. Man, I know he's doing a lot of uh, stuff behind the scenes. Now it's always fun to talk to you. Um, I do have some questions for you if we have a little bit of time. Dude, let's go. I'm ready. All right. Um, so, who's your favorite beat reporter? Mine for me is <laughs> Connor Rogers from The Athletic. Uh, I just think he's pretty good at what he does. And um, well, that's Connor really Hughes. Think- Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Con- Connor Rogers is from Stick to Football. Uh, yeah, Connor Hughes. I really like Connor Hughes from uh, The Athletic. Um, he writes some really good stories, and he gets some good scoops um, every now and then. But what about you? Uh, yeah, I'd probably say him too. I think he's he's probably the most out of all of them, and he gives a lot of good insight on like a lot of the signings. He gives a lot of good detail on the on the player. He st- he, he stays out of a lot of the headliney stuff. So. I definitely like him. I actually like Connor Rogers for a lot of his scoop on just a breakdown of players. Um, the rest of the guys, yeah. it's just, you know, they're all kind of pretty much cooped in together, I think, at this point. It's, it, it's crazy because social media has changed so many things now, man, where so many, so many people have a voice now. Like you have bloggers and podcasters and former players. Like 
you know, Brian Baldinger is an excellent X and O's guy. You know, like, why, it's like, I don't need to read Rich Mini's report. I'd rather read Brian Baldinger break down a film. You know, like, so it's, there's so many different outlets now that we never had before. So it's, it makes it a lot more interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, it, it even feels like we have a lot of divas just on the beat. <laughs> but it's oh, just yeah. funny and entertaining. Um, my next question for you, because I know uh, you're really into MMA, and I've just been starting to get into it and now with that's like the only sporting we have. So I wanted to get your thoughts on um, Khabib and the lightweight division overall and what you think of him as a fighter. Oof, that's right in my wheelhouse. Khabib is he's amazing, man. He is ridiculously dominant. Um he his ground game is is just he just mauls people and his stand up game is getting a lot better, which makes him you know, a very tough challenge. I mean Justin Gagey fighting him would be really interesting to see if Khabib would actually stand with him or go to the ground. Um, you know, him and Conor McGregor are probably gonna go back at it again. But Tony Ferguson, it's unfortunate that he lost his last fight, but I think that had a lot to do with two weight cuts and a training camp that lasted like six months, which was ridiculous. Tony Ferguson is as talented as they come, man. So yeah. the division is stacked. I mean, it really, it's, it's really, really exciting. Um, you hope all these guys stay healthy and they can actually get to the fight. Like, you know, Khabib is just so good, man. And it's just these fights. I want to see him fight Tony Ferguson. And I, a, a part of me thinks that Tony Ferguson could have beat him because he's so friggin' well-rounded and so diverse. Like what, what we saw, like Tony Ferguson's last fight, is not really who he is, man. He's so much better than that. So we'll see, man. It's it's an exciting weight division. I love that class. It's it's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I've just been kind of learning about it, getting into it. And Tony Ferguson, I, I you know, he had that win that large win streak. I think it was ten matches. Um, yep. But you could just see how tough he was, man. Like this guy you know, just was taking shots left yep. and right, and he's oh my goodness, and he's it looks he's like so he much- a skinny. He's so diverse, though, dude. Like, his striking is, like, next level. He's so creative. Like, that just wasn't who he was. Like, if you watch his earlier fights and you see that fight, it just it just wasn't him, man. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, I, I definitely will because I'm definitely interested in it now. Uh, so I always like uh, like when you guys mix a little MMA into the convo. Oh, dude, I could talk. I mean, I train, like, where we train at down here in Jersey, man. Where, where, where do you live? Well, I used to live in Jersey, uh, you know, Central, but now I'm in Los Angeles. I'm closer to Joe. Oh, no kidding. I was say, because, like, I'm down the Jersey Shore, man. Right now, like, in our school that we train at, it's everybody, man. You got Cody Garbrandt. You got Frankie Yeager, Corey Anderson. Wow. Like, Mar- you know, Marlon Murray used to train with us. Edson Barbosa used to train with us. Like, so we, like, we had the, I had the benefit of, like, training next to some of the best fighters in the world. Like, Eddie Alvarez is in there. Like, so I wow. can watch all them, watch them train, watch them, you know, like, all these different things. So it's like we get like a pay per view every Thursday and Saturday there just to watch them, you know, spar and stuff. So I'm gonna say if you're in Jersey, man, but you in, come watch because it's just insane. Oh man, when I do visit, I would love to just do that. Just I haven't even been to like a gym, and I know it'd just be a crazy cool atmosphere. Yeah, man, I know whenever jet, everything gets back to normal, we have Jet games, or you know, they're coming to LA twice this year, so I'm gonna try to go to both those games. Uh, but I can't wait to meet you, Joe, you know, everyone. I mean, all the callers. I, I love Steve. I love, uh, you know, Tyrone, Justin. Oh, I, I, you know, my favorite time is when Justin and Joe go at it at the end of the show. <laughs> oh, my God, it's such a good time. And I, I think the Steve and you, like, like Steve has gotten so much better as a caller because of you. And Joe translating for him is just awesome. Like, you know, I, I just love all that, man. Dude, we're having a blast, man. It's just, and it's cool. Like we have a lot of fun and we joke around and stuff. And then meeting everybody and like tailgating and hanging out and watching the games makes you. At the end, they were all just fans. We all want to win. We all want to have a good time. And it's just, it's cool meeting everybody and having like this little Jets community. It's always, it's always just a pleasure, man. It really is. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, it's great, and you can just tell we're a big family, um, and you know we all we're all tough together. But yo. Uh, it would be cool that if, you know, once they get the next big UFC card in, if you could just run a podcast about that. Uh, I don't know if you guys are willing to do that, but that would just be real cool. Dude, you know what's funny? I'll, I'll give you a little secret. Prime Time has been begging me to do this for about six months now. <laughs> he's like, dude, you know all this stuff. And he's, I'm like, yeah, but I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm like I'd have to do a disclaimer because I'd be completely biased because if any of my friends fight, I'm going to favor him. I'm not going to give out any other secrets, but – we could do it. I mean, he's been telling me, we got to do it. We got to do it. And I'm like, ah, I, dude, I would do it. It's just, 
it, it's it's a great sport that I'm glad is catching on. Um, so really, there's a lot behind it, a lot of strategy, a lot of technique. Everybody keeps saying, oh, they're just like, you know, it's a blood sport. No, it's not really a blood sport. There's a lot of really, there's a lot of science behind it. There's a lot of you know, strategy. It's a, I love the sport. I can't get enough of it. I train five days a week. I love it. And uh, I mean, we will, dude. I, maybe we will. I, I, he keeps talking about it. I, he, now you have to commence now. It's not probably going to do this too now. <laughs> yeah, man. I think you have some unique insight. And if it is one of your friends uh, about to fight, then, you know, then you're, you'll play more of a reporter. You may bring someone on to ask questions. But I was just watching that Joe Rogan with uh, Justin Gaethje that just came out. And just you hear his coach talk, and I'm just like, wow, man, there's so much that goes into this. It's a fascinating sport, and it's taking over the world, and it's exploding, man. You know what the really cool thing is? And I'll, I'll be really honest with you. I did an MMA podcast like um, a year and a half ago, for or two years ago, for my school where I trained at. And um, cool. when you interview the fighters as opposed to the NFL players, it's like night and day. The fighters are so down to earth and so willing to talk mm. about their sport and give you all the dirty down details as opposed to NFL players. They're very like, you can't really get much out of them. The agent says you can't ask this, you can't ask that. Dude, in MMA, they'll tell you anything, dude. Like, like, I, like I interviewed Eddie Alvarez, and I was scared out of my mind. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, he's really intimidating. I'm like, I'm not sure what to ask him. I, I thought I was going to do like five or ten minutes with him. We did like 35 minutes. And the guy was so wow. well-spoken, well thought out. And like even Paul Felder, like I, thought, I interviewed him, and I was like, man, I'm like, ten minutes, man, I promise. He's like, bro, just ask whatever you want. I got all the time in a day. And every, every, every interview was like a half hour. And they, didn't worry, they were like going on. I felt bad. I'm like, listen, I'll cut it short. I'm a nobody. I'm not the magazine or nothing like that. He's like, no, we're good. They're all super cool, and they're super like just – they want to talk about the sport. They talk about their strategies, their weight training. Their, it's, it's night and day than the NFL, man. It's like nothing else I've ever dealt with. It's so interesting. It's because they got to market themselves because they got to sell their shirts and sell tickets to their fights, but they're really, really educated, and they're very well-spoken. It's, it's really interesting, man. Yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of classy people in there. I love the sportsmanship, you know, before and after a fight between, you know, yep. individuals that respect each other. But then I also love the side when they're enemies and they're just, yep. you know, going for each other's necks. So it's like, it's just, it's just amazing sport. So I'm just excited to learn more, man. But it was great chatting with you, Tyson, like always. Um, I'm, I'm definitely can't wait for the season. Well, give out your information, man. You got to give out, give out your information. <laughs> What's the best way for everybody to follow you? Yeah, it's got to be on Twitter, man. So follow me at Hakeem Amir. That's H-A-K-E-E-M-A-M-I-R. Um, anything, anything Jets, I'm down for. Uh, Jets are my number one team. I, I love sports all around, but Jets are my number one team. I, I tell everyone that I would take one Jet Super Bowl before I take 10 NBA Finals championships for my other team. You know what I mean? So I'm a Jet no, fan, diehard first. And um, don't worry, guys. We're 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 heading in the right way. Just be patient, and you're going to see some good things happen this year. Akeem, thank you so much for your time, man. We got to do this again very soon. Absolutely. Uh, thanks again, Tyson. Take care. Have, have a good night. All right. I was Hakeem Amir, as always. Well, first I want to thank him. That was awesome. That was an hour. That was such a good time. Um, if you want to get on this show, all you got to do is direct messages. Talk Jets Radio on Instagram and Twitter. I'm Tyson Roush, T-R-A-U-C-H 21, and we'll talk to you next time.